Hello everyone, it's Lionheart here, and this is the very first of my promised new starter guides. And this one is focusing on the Northern Realms. We are going to take the new starter deck that is available to Northern Realms players. It is an uprising list. I'm going to show you how to play it, including a single game with it, its basic synergies, and point out some of the obvious things that a new player might miss. I'm then going to teach you what the reward book is, where to spend your rewards, especially as a new player, and what that allows you with the new starter tree that exists, play a game with the deck that that creates, and then give you some advice on how to take that finished new starter deck and build it into something that will allow you to keep climbing throughout Gwent. I'm going to be doing one of these for all six factions, and there are going to be some new starter videos with other key points that I feel that the introduction to Gwent doesn't really go over, and you just have to learn as you go along. So hopefully you enjoy these videos. If you do, please do drop a like on the video and subscribe to the channel. As I say, there is a lot more coming. If you think there's anything I missed that is absolutely crucial that new players should know for Northern Realms or something you'd like to see in the series going forward, let me know in the comments down below. I have lots and lots of content coming up for brand new players for Gwent in 2022. The game is in such a great space right now. So much variety, so much versatility, and as I'm about to show you, for new players, it is so, so generous, but the tutorial doesn't really cover everything you need, so hopefully I can bridge that gap for you a little bit. I hope you enjoy. Let's go straight in. These keys are going to change everything for you, and there is something new in the reward book that Gwent wants to show us. The reward book is available through this here, so if we were to click this, click this, or in this instance, click view, all of these pages will open up to you, but Gwent has done an amazing job here of giving you new starter trees. We are Northern Realms, that's the list we chose to play, so it's the Northern Realms tree we want. The starter deck we're playing with is a very, very, very basic deck. And when we complete this, and then this, and this, and this, all of these cards synergize with our deck to make it even better. We use our reward keys, to get ourselves rewards. But when you reach one of these, it's a new quest. We have to finish a match in any online game mode to complete this quest, which will be our next task. Our reward will be a new card called Voimir that we'll be adding to the deck. Okay, we are facing Grump Bum. Close ranks. Okay, this is someone playing the White Frost starter deck. So, early on, you are only really going to face one of six potential lists. All of which are available in the Meta Snapshot Report, all of which have a deck guide from me. So you can learn what your opponent is and isn't playing by watching these lists. So you can learn how to play with them, which will help teach you how to play against them. Okay. Going into the first round then. I'm going to say we're pretty happy to see one done banner. I'm on blue coin early on. I probably don't want both tridams, but I don't mind one of them with no thinning. Tamarian can go. I like having access to Geralt here. This makes me nervous. Okay, that's better. So, I need a proactive play. A proactive play, we're going to play the Carrick City Guard here. Because it's an engine that is going to find value instantly. This is the first game we've played against a real player. My opponent, as you can see, it, they're going to take longer to play. Because they're still very new to the game. They're trying to learn the mechanics. You'll often see them hovering your card. So when I hover it, it's blue. When your opponent is hovering a card, it will be red. And they're probably looking going, what does this do? How, what about that? Do I have to worry about this? And as a result, you might see the rope timer a little longer and games will take longer. My opponent here is playing Nithril. Unlike the AI, they have already made a positive decision. They've played it on the correct row and currently they have dominance. Now they've forgotten to press pass. The game won't auto pass unless there are no actions you can take. While they can't use their order ability, they could have used the leader charge. Not that I'd recommended it, but I now am in an interesting situation. I get to make a choice. I can trade the engine value of this to use the order ability. The order ability will move an enemy unit. Well, 
I have an enemy unit that just so happens to want to be moved. So, I'm going to say farewell to our friend Nithril. And I'm going to be very happy. I am going to play... I think here I'm going to play the Dun Banner into this row. Remember, we need to boost this. Thankfully, I have my tactical advantage. I boost it. I thin. And I'm very happy. My opponent here using a leader charge. Their leader charge is being used. And they've picked the right card. They picked my tallest unit here to do damage to. Because one of the mechanics Monsters worries about is dominant. Okay. Um... That was a bit of a mistake from my opponent, because they've now wasted these two turns. They shouldn't have used that second leader charge. Um, so the first decision they made was correct, because damaging this card is great for them. Oh, and they haven't played a card yet, because they're worrying about what to do. They have now played a card. So my opponent is stacking Frost, but because they didn't have dominance at the time of using this, they have lost a lot of value here because they've now got no value from the frost they used on the front row. But that's okay, that's fine. Again, they're learning the game still. It's completely normal. And you're going to make mistakes. I have played this game, my main account 4,000 hours, my old account probably 2,000 hours, and I make mistakes every single time I play this game. It's completely normal. So don't stress about that. What I, have, what I do have to worry about here though is reach. Because when this frost hits, we're actually on even points already. So I would quite like to get myself into a situation where I have an engine ticking so that my opponent doesn't start to put pressure on and win the round on even. Oh, that's a fair point. It's just been pointed out to me. My opponent currently has eight cards in hand, two on board, and 20 in the deck. Now, one of the things that Gwent doesn't do very well to introduce you as a new player is explain the key mechanics for deck building. There's a whole video coming up on it, but it's very, very important. You want to have 25 cards in your deck. Ideally, no more. Ideally, no less. The reason for this is it will allow you to find your cards consistently. So, I'm gonna set up a second engine here because I am currently behind on even cards. We know the Tridam is going to do that. I'm ahead because I have two more points here. This will boost once and I will damage. Also, we're starting to get uh, the dominance back as well. The Gwent tutorial was better than it used to be, but really, I would say it's more confusing than helpful if I'm being completely honest with you. Yeah. Are you cold, human insect? It won't be long now. Now, my opponent here is constantly making sure, because they are on red coin, going second, that they stay ahead of me. That is good, because it means I can never pass. I'm, I have multiple decisions to make as a result. I either have to commit a slightly better card than I'd like in order to get out or create enough distance between myself that I can afford to pass, or I have to lose the round in an uncomfortable situation. In this, I believe I'm, it's worth committing a decent card here. So, I'm going to play Prince Stennis. I've changed my mind. I'm going to play Neneke. Neneke and Stennis are similar, but Neneke has charges. I can use Neneke to give myself dominance and double the value of her boosts by hitting the Tridam infantry. There is a risk to this though. You can see I am now at eight points. One to, oh, we get the surrender. My opponent really is going in. All right. So I'm punished for row stacking. One of the things we have to do in this list is row stack and it's certainly against this leader ability. Again, my opponent puts us in a situation where I am behind them by four points and I have to play a card. Really nicely done. My engine is plus one onto this and damage them. So plus two, I go to 15 points. I need to be at 18 points because their engine is not on. I could play my Kerrick City Guard here, 
odds are that's probably not winning me the round because they should keep playing but i'm going to do it because it's just enough points and again bear in mind this is the very very first version of the deck as we play each game we're going to go in and out of the reward book complete those quests and add the new cards in every single time so that when we do that we improve our deck to the be the completed new player deck we'll then play with that and then see what would we add to make it even better to work out what we're going to spend our sort of our rewards on next Did he have a good stream and if he's here hi crow's here okay now we have an interesting position because i am down by two points but i'm not because my engine is two points I get to make a decision. Do I want to keep playing here? Or is this now the position where I choose to pass? Because my opponent either has to commit a card or we draw the round. If we draw the round, we're going into what would be a final round early. Now, in this situation, I don't want to play the Trident. Geralt of Rivia doesn't currently have a good target. Stennis is one of the best cards that I have available. And I don't currently have a target to lock. So, I am going to choose to pass here. Because both of us are going to be on 15 points. Meaning my opponent either plays one of these cards to win the round. Which means I have given up control of the round. And they will choose whether to push me or not. But I'm fine with that. Because I don't really want to commit any of these cards. And it was the first available pass that I had. And they commit the Osral here, consuming a card from my graveyard to boost themselves. Just about gets them ahead. But it's a big piece of the puzzle. This is usually one of your shorter round finishing moves as monsters to consume the biggest available unit in either graveyard. So it's quite a big play from the opponent to have to give that to get ahead there. We love Ronvid. This card is perfect into a, into a second or first round because it's going to give me that carryover value later. Here is the risk. Having lost round one, our opponent can choose to bleed us or push. I now have to make sure that my hand is good enough to resist that bleed, but not so good that I play all of my good cards and then have nothing left to win with. I am going to mulligan away my Prince Stennis now. There is a risk to this. I may never see this card now, and I may lose the game as a result. But as we build the deck with new cards, you'll see that there are lots of different ways to get cards mid-game. When you get cards mid-game with what we call tutors, it makes things a little bit easier. I'm currently creating a new starter guide for YouTube for Gwent. One of many that are coming our way. Ronvid is on the board. Our carryover is established. Now, when we're being bled by our opponent of our cards, one point is crucial. Stay ahead at all costs. Because we want to maintain our card advantage now. This, and I'm going to get out of the way, is a card from the, the starter deck. Unfortunately, and this will look very scary because it will summon an old spear tip at 18 power. Here's the problem. The new starter deck was made before it had this ability and does not include this card. So while I will be advising new players to craft and put this in, a lot of people you face will actually have this effectively as a six for six brick. So it's worth bearing that in mind. Just in case though, I'm going to respect the card and I'm going to lock its ability. Just in case. I know the likelihood of them having the other card is almost zero. But just in case. Our opponent now. Working out what they want to do. We see Red Riders. This card is going to uh, has a multiple set of options. They will get to pick which of the three they would like. Most of them are... Well, they're all Frost based. It could either spawn Frost on one row for four turns... Okay, so they picked the wrong option there, but that's fine. Um, once again, we're currently even. 
but we're not. Because, of course, there's another turn of frost that is going to hit me. So I'm actually only on eight points here. It's important, then, to make sure that I don't if they give them a pass. Ahead, so I'm on 14, which means at the start of my next turn, if they pass, I'm on 12 points. And as I say, it is worth mentioning, opponent could well have added this card in if they've watched one of my videos and they've seen that I've advised this if they're a little bit further through. So it's certainly worth respecting this card. You can stop it from becoming an 18 power card by damaging this, but of course the armor is in the way. If this was 18 base power, it would have been the perfect move to play this, the Osral they played earlier, in combination with it later. Yeah, so Frost, weather effects trigger at the start of the owner's turn. The owner is the person whose side of the board the effect is on for clarity. Opponent has dominance right now, which is bad for us. And I have no... I do have a couple of ways of getting it away from them. I can turn this engine off with dominance, and I think I want to do that. So, I'm going to play the Tridam... I'm going to boost the Tridam with my Order ability. And I have a choice. I'm already ahead here still, so I don't really need to use my Leader ability. In fact, I think it would be overcommitting to do so. So we're just going to end our turn here. We don't need to do that. We are just going to end our turn here. Ooh, a brand new keyword. A brand new status. Immunity. This cannot be manually targeted. So, if this was above 9, Geralt of Rivia could not kill it because I cannot target it. But that immunity is just to being clicked. My Tridam, with its random pings, could hit it. So that's what that means. Worth mentioning. Thrive is another mechanic that only monsters have. If you play a unit that is bigger than the current power, it will boost itself by one. I only need to play four points here. Actually, I need to play five points here. I don't want to commit Geralt. I don't want to commit Anna. I'm going to play this as it plays for six. You can see the opponent is negating a lot of my damage value with this armor. That's because this engine here... Every time they play a unit, they are gaining one armor. And my opponent jams what they think might be a winning card for them. An ice giant here. Lots of points. My opponent is ahead by six points. So I would already need seven. But this will grow again. So if I want to win this in one go, I need eight points. Can I get eight points? This is going to play for four. And it's going to boost five, six... 7, 8, even if we miss because the armor is going to absorb. So I play this here. I boost her once. I now pass. So they bled me, but that bleed was unsuccessful realistically because while they did get some really key pieces out of us, I have one additional card putting me in a pretty great spot. They gave up their ability to have last say for that push, and it hurt them. It's still not over at this stage, though, because my cards are built around being engine cards, so the value of them is diminished quite a lot in a shorter round, right? So this card, for instance, is going to be much worse. This might be useful, as it's just a deploy effect that just finds points, but there's a risk-reward to it because I could lose those points. Geralt of Rivia is also probably not going to find value here, but I'm not going to... I'm not going to get rid of it just in case. And we open here with our... There's a chance, especially against monsters, that Geralt can find value in every round. I don't think it does. Okay, so you may be wondering what just happened there. Our opponent played an Anel Conqueror. Stop laughing. However, 
The deployability for this card is destroy self. You might be thinking, well, that's terrible. Why would you ever do this? Well, because in a devotion deck, one that runs no neutrals, the deploy ability is cancelled. However, Mantlet is a neutral card. I feel, I don't believe this is the exact starter deck. And if this is in the starter deck, I will be sending messages to CDPR. Because um, it just shouldn't be. I'm going to play the drummer now. Left, right, we are going left. to protect my drummer engine. And I'm going to boost the Ronvid. But I will certainly be looking at that starter deck. And of course we will discuss that as part of the Monsters new starter deck challenge that you'll see in another video. Oh, actually, okay, so it's not in the starter deck, but it is in the new starter tree, which is actually quite anti-synergistic. Also, our opponent here should not have used this order ability yet. They could have gained a lot more points here. They're worried about me removing it, so they clicked it straight away. But it would have grown by one point, and the three damage that they just used would actually have played for six value if they just waited. Okay, looks like the monster starter guide is going to be the one that needs the most changes. And while my Geralt of Rivia is playing for just the three points, I don't need to use my leader ability. We've already won the game comfortably. And that is our first win with Northern Realms. And we, of course, send a GG to our opponent because they then gain resources from it. And so do we. You will see we we've completed our quest. The first thing we do is we go back to the reward book because we have completed this quest. I can now progress and spend more of these reward points. I now have a new quest. Once we complete all of these, each card we find, we are going to add into our deck to make it slightly bigger. So Voimir, the card we just unlocked, is now going to go into our deck here. And you can see from another game, we played one game once again. I gain a reward point, and another reward point, and more reward points. The game is so generous to new players. The so I decided to skip over the actual gameplay for these games, as it was quite repetitive. You're going to go through all of the things we've just learned, and play through after every game. Make sure you complete that new starter tree. I'm going to take you now straight to the point where we'd already completed the new starter tree. We have finished the new starter tree. Now it is time to go into the deck builder and make the best of those cards. We have our Northern Realm starter deck. Is it going to duplicate today? It might not. This is a known bug. So if it doesn't duplicate, we are going to build the list from scratch and that's absolutely fine. So it is a Northern Realms uprising list. Time to build your first deck. Choose your faction, ability and cards. We are going to stay as intended. Northern Realms, Uprising, and we're going to build the deck. Now, cards that we gained. The first one, and possibly, arguably, one of the best cards in Northern Realms. It is Amphibious Assault. This is what you will hear referred to as a tutor card in a lot of instances because it tutors a card out of your deck. This has been a long-standing staple in Northern Realms, and it has the feature of being an Echo card. What does that mean? Well, it explains it over on the right hand side for you, if I get that out of the way. Echo. At the beginning of the round, move this card from the graveyard to the top of the owner's deck. So I play it once and pull a Northern Realms unit from my deck with a provision cross of nine or less. If I pull a four provision card, it will boost by five for the extra provisions. Fantastic card for finding important cards, but also for that little bit of point slam. And I get to play it twice. Amazing card. Huge, huge fan of this card. And it is definitely going to be in basically every Northern Realms list you play. Always. However, it's an important card that we want to find. It is a Warfare card. Well, this is John Natalis, another card we just unlocked. He allows us to play a Warfare card from our deck. His only purpose is to tutor Warfare cards. And he's a lot of provisions for such a little amount of power. But, as I mentioned in other videos, the rule of 16 
you are only going to have up to 16 turns in Gwent. So you want as many provisions spent efficiently. This card removes a card from my deck to play it, and that card plays a card. So I get a lot of provision value if I find those resources. We're completely going to pair those in together, because a lot of the time you'll notice we've been missing the Temerian Drummers. For instance, when we've been playing, well that can be really frustrating if we can't pair our engines together. No problem, we have something that can tutor it out for us, which feels amazing. Another card we unlocked, the famous Prince Anses. If you've ever played Thronebreaker, you will know of this lad. But in Gwent, I like him a little bit more. It is a dueling card. Now, I am in the way of duel, so I'll read it to you. Units take turns dealing damage equal to the power until one of them is destroyed. So, if I'm inspired, let's say I've boosted this to one by playing it on the back row. I'm now at five. I duel. I am at five power. I hit with that five power. It hits back with whatever is left. So, you can duel backwards and forwards for a little while, potentially. This is a, an amazing card for removal. And with our leader ability, the beauty is we can play it in the front row, meaning we can play it straight away, which feels really nice. Back. Okay. The next card in our list. Another big card. Notice 10 provisions. Now, 10 provisions means we cannot pull it from Amphibious Assault. Always something to bear in mind when you see these cards in your hand early. Adalia, another low power for so many provisions. And you might think as a new player, this can't be worth it. This can't be worth it. Well, you spawn and play a base copy of a Northern Realms unit, Bronze Northern Realms unit, from your hand and give it a shield. So she gives me an entire not another Bronze card. Well, how many times have we seen our engines removed and thought, ooh, one of those, another one of those would be great. Even better, it comes with a shield. Well, one of those shielded, that's going to make it very, very difficult to deal with, especially early on. Especially in the lower ranks, that can be really, really difficult. And she has some synergy for other leader abilities that I will probably advise a little bit later. And yes, I did mistake Anseus for Villem, although I'm sure they talk about Anseus in Thronebreaker, right? So we're going to include Adali into this list. Now, this list is going to be very... It's going to be the new starter deck, and we're going to add the new things we found. So Neneke was in the new starter deck, and so was Stennis. Surrender is one of those early meta lists. It, it exists in almost every list, and it's difficult for Northern Realms because we row stack quite a lot. It's worth keeping in your list. Anastenga, one of the key pieces for our deck. She is only seven provisions. Better yet, if we were to tutor Anastrenga from our Amphibious Assault, she would be boosted by the two remaining provisions. And as we want Anna inspired, she actually arrives at us inspired and is much more difficult to deal with at six. Feels very good for us. Dora Gray is a lock. And I'm going to put Dora Gray in initially. But there are some considerations. Now, these Karak Frigates are also two cards that we unlocked. So we're going to add both of those in. I really like this. A lot of new abilities to consider here. To the point where I'm actually going to go to the other side for a second so you can see them. This has a new function, resupply. It has a cooldown of two. Every time that cooldown goes down, you click the boat. When you click the boat, it spawns a volunteer. So this is an engine. But if it's crewed, its cooldown is one. So every single turn you click the boat until the row is full, that could be a really scary engine to deal with. Also, for our list, gives us lots of bodies on the board that could potentially be inspired. If they're inspired, it makes our leader ability even better, which feels really nice. So you're definitely running the boats. A card now... I believe this was also a card given to us. This is Voimir. Voimir boosts an allied unit and all its copies on the board by one and give them armor. Well, but you can only have two copies of a card, right? 
Well, with a Dahlia, maybe we have three on the board. Better yet, these volunteers count. We could have a lot more than three copies of this on the board and is a lovely little pairing. Something I would definitely recommend trying out. I would add Voimir into your deck. You will see some of the new starter decks throw in the commandos. That's an entire different archetype and I personally wouldn't recommend it. While they are good thinning value because you play one, click and it brings the other and can be paired really nicely with a blue stripe scout. I wouldn't recommend them in the list that we're playing because they don't make sense. So we have our deck, but John the Talus currently only has one other Warfare card. These are both cards we've added in. There was one other new starter card that was in your tree, and this is Reinforcements. Spawn and play a base copy of a bronze allied unit. Well, that's very convenient because it's an additional backup Warfare card. We don't want to be in the situation where John the Talus and Amphibious Assault are both in our hand. And then John the Talus has nothing to pull. We do not want to play a two power card and spend eight provisions doing so. But wait, we have a problem. I have now added in this reinforcements to our list. We have 26 cards, which is okay, but not ideal. But we've spent five too many provisions. So now we have to start looking... Where do we have cards that we don't need in the list anymore, that don't make sense? We've added all the new starter cards to this, and it gives us an opportunity. We're going to remove one. Now, you always want to keep your deck at maximum provisions if you can, because it's the most efficient way of doing things. That doesn't mean add 40 low-value cards to your deck, though, as a new player. I would recommend looking at those high-value cards and doing exactly what we're doing here. I need to cut five provisions, but thankfully, I am one card over. So let's look at our five provision cards. Well, the Temerian Drummer, pretty key to what we're doing. Probably one of our better engine cards. It's unlikely he's going to get the cut. Our next five provision card is the Lyrian Lance Connect. Okay, it's not a terrible card. Base power of four, if we play it on the back row, boosts itself to five. So this card could be worth four points on the front row with one damage. So it could be worth as little as five. Could be worth as high as 8 points. It's a consideration. We're not a damage heavy list. But a little bit doesn't necessarily hurt. Especially in the early meta. When you're fighting for dominance against monster players. Maybe this one. I'm more inclined to get rid of one of the Temerian infantry. Because it can have a much lower floor. The floor is the minimum it's going to play for. Or well, the minimum this is going to play for is 3. Because if there are no boosted units on our row. This could be quite an awkward card to have. It has a much higher ceiling though. Because if I play this onto a row with 8 boosted cards. Well this card plays for 11. Which is higher than the Lance Connect. My question is how often am I ever going to hold this card to make it play for that value? And how many times is there going to be an 8 power unit on the board to actually get the value from that? So I'm inclined to say this is the front runner to remove. Last but not least, this lovely lady, the Kerrick City Guard. This is an engine and gives us a rare bit of flexibility moving an opponent's unit to turn some, an engine off, make it a little bit more awkward. I like one of this card initially. I'm not saying you'll keep it forever, but I think it's more useful. So I'm going to say we're going to kick one Temerian Infantry and our deck is looking ready to girls. When we finish this game, we're going to see what we can do to maximize those provisions and what we're going to work towards to make the best possible version of this deck to help you level up. It's time to see how our new completed new starter tree. How is it going to feel? We've been quite successful so far, but all of a sudden we have just infinitely improved our deck. There is a lot more power. A lot more power. Ooh. Now, Syndicate's something you wouldn't have expected to see as a new player up until very recently. The Syndicate new starter deck has only just joined the game. I wouldn't recommend it for a brand new player. Just because it's a little bit more complex, has a mechanic called coins, profit, lots of other things to consider. But, well, there's going to be a whole guide for that as well. Let's take a look. What have we got? Queen Adalia always wants to make sure it has a bronze card in hand to be able to take a copy of. We have plenty, so there is no problem there. 
Against Congregate, this is a swarming kind of deck. So Surrender may be very, very useful for us. We have our Drummers. I'm going to say I don't want the Lanch Connect. Brilliant. And I don't think we want to side them this early. So normally, especially for Northern Realms, you're probably fishing early on to try and find your John Natalis or your Amphibious Assault. Because they help thin your deck down, but also play for a lot of value. Because if we can get these cards played, they will thin a card and then thin another card. Meaning we have less cards left in deck to find later, allowing us to pull off our synergies more concisely, more repetitively. Now, early on, this is an engine that wants to be played. But it does want to be crewed. Crew is when it's between two soldiers. There are instances of cards that are crewed by mages, but it will say so on the card. I'm just going to open with Ronvid. He is a soldier. I'm going to play him here. For this most beautiful of maidens, because next turn, when I play the frigate, I'm going to play it to here on the right-hand side of Ronvid because it spawns a soldier to the right of itself and it crews itself. Now, this is a very good card on their part. And this is the mechanic I was talking about, Profit. It profited by two. So you can see, actually you can't quite see because I'm in the way of it. If I just move out of the way, there is a coin purse here. They have currently got one coin. There is also a, an explainer about it as well. I will cover all of that in the Syndicate Guide. But it's certainly worth noting that this can spend the coins to spawn a unit. And lots of different cards can spend in lots of different ways. We're just going to start our engine here. It's an order ability and it hasn't got zeal. So I have to wait a turn to click. I could have protected this engine with tactical advantage. But in the early meta, I'm always a little nervous that Geralt of Rivia might exist. They have locked our engine. Not ideal. But the beautiful thing for us, Adalia still exists. And I have the second one in hand. So, our next plan then. How are we going to play from here? I'm going to play Queen Adalia up on this row. We're going to make another Kerex Frigate from the one in hand. And for Tempo, as I am now at seven points, seven cards, I am going to use the Tactical Advantage, but I'm going to use it on a Dahlia. She only goes to eight, which means I don't have to worry about Geralt. This one has a shield, so damage at the moment isn't going to hurt it. It's protected. They play a Ludovicus. Wow, okay. And you can see lots of different abilities. This has to sit on the board for three turns, but it will gain nine coins if it survives. That's the maximum that it could ever gain. That you can't have more than nine coins at a time in your pocket as Syndicate. Here's the problem. I, we have no way of dealing with that. Or do we? We have only one lock available to us. Dora Gray. And you have to weigh up when... It's important to use this card. Is this going to be our best lock? Well, you're a new player. You might not know the answer to that. I'm inclined to say this is a pretty great lock. Because it's denying nine coins. We've already seen nine coins on this card. Could potentially be worth 18 points. So this could potentially deny 18 points. So I'm going to do it. Most importantly, click the boat. Unfortunately, we aren't crewed, so the cooldown is at two right now. And the cooldown will only refresh to one when it's clicked. So I now do have to wait those turns if I choose to play a soldier here. Completely worth it, though. We are comfortably ahead. Our opponent's big threat is off the table. They could purify it if they have access to it, but it doesn't look like they do. Instead... They play a Keeper of the Flame, boost some cards. We are very happy with that. At this point, we always need to consider how much further do we want to play into the round. So, we are currently up by six points. We're going first with a blue coin player. So we need to make the decision, is it safe to keep playing here? If I play, let's say this to Marion Drummer, am I in a safe position? Is my opponent going to find a way 
to take over, be ahead of me at the end of my next turn, and put some real pressure on. I don't think we're, we have to worry right now. I think we can afford to potentially play one of these Temerian drummers and crew this Carrick frigate. The reason I think that is Let's it will allow us to have multiple Let's engines a turn run. from now. We're ahead by not just 10, but 11, and if they come back to us, 12 as well. That's a lot of points at this rank to try and find. So I'm not, not too worried. The only time I'm, I would start to get worried is a couple of turns from now when I don't really want to keep playing cards. But for now, we're fine. I can click the boat, which would take us up to 37, and this will boost us to 38. So my opponent already needs to find nine points. Now we need to look at which cards we want to give. We've already seen that I'm not overly keen on playing the Tridam Infantries early, because I love the combination a little bit later with Anna Strenger or with the drummers. As a result, I don't want to give a drummer. So, the Tiberian Infantry feels fine. It's got two boosted units on this row, so it's going to play for five. Not amazing. We could use leader charges if we needed to. To create a bit more distance. But given our engine value here, I don't think it's necessary to do that. So, we're just going to play this. We are going to do two damage. That two damage is going to be used to just remove one of those zealots. And we're ahead again by 13 points this time. Okay. We are in a position. I have to click this engine. There are two different types of engine. Passive and active. This is a passive engine. It will keep happening as long as the turns keep going backwards and forwards. Even if I've passed. This one requires me to click. Ugh, so I can't consider it. Be the death of me. Thank you, opponent. If your opponent talks too much, you can click there and mute them. Now, this surrender is really nice for us. So I am going to click the boat here. I am going to use the surrender because it strips armor and it does two damage after the armor is stripped, which is really nice. That should win us this game, or at least win us this round. Should be good enough to win us the round. But my opponent chooses to keep playing, and I'm not sure that's a good idea. The reason I don't think it was a good idea, they played this card on the wrong row initially, because this row is almost full. This is a passive engine that spawns, but there's already one, two, three, four, five, six, now seven cards on this row. So this is only going to be active a couple of times at most. The big problem is we both have three cards, but I have 15 more points than my opponent with a passive engine. I'm now going to pass and say to my opponent, okay, catch me. Show me which card catches me. And I can go through the things I know about the new starter decks to make a safe assumption. Well, if Geralt of Rivia was there, it wouldn't be any effect. My opponent has just realized they cannot catch us. We just won that round on even cards from blue coin. That should be quite infrequent, but when you get the nuance of when to pass, especially early, but honestly, even into higher ranks in Gwent, you will find this kind of thing happens. The beauty for us now, we have already run around, but are in complete control of how far we push our opponent. Are we better in a short round, or are we better in a long round? Well, realistically, we're actually pretty great in a long round, but we want to make sure, because our opponent is also, in this instance, pretty good in a long round, we want to push. Unfortunately, we still haven't seen Natalis. Or Amphibious Assault, which is a bit of a shame. I wanted to see more of these new cards to demonstrate what they could do. Thankfully, round one, Adalia and the boat show just how powerful they can be. For us here, we are going to set up some value. And we're just going to drop a Lanch Connect on the board. The beauty of the situation we're in, as I said, we're in control. We don't need to win this round. We can choose to. But whenever we pass, the opponent is going to have the same number of cards as us. This is what is brilliant for us. Normally when you win round one, you've, you've done it spending one more card than your opponent. As a result, if you do choose to push or bleed the opponent of their cards, you have to make sure you're far enough ahead when you do that 
that when you pass, they still have to play at least one more card. When you win on even, it takes that threat away. Now, the Lance Connect is brilliant here. Damage by three. Their engine is three. Fantastic. Great for us. Absolutely no problem. And I'm just going to establish a second engine, or rather a first engine in this instance for us, and just get that ticking. I could have set the boat up here, but I feel I'm going to want the boat later, so I'm not too worried. This is a scary engine, and it has a veil. Veil, we've discussed briefly, but I'll recover, prevents other statuses. What does that mean? Well, it means you can't lock it, because lock is a status. It means it can't gain bleeding. It means it can't gain vitality. Among it, No status can be attributed to this. But because Veil itself is a status, if you purify this, it can then gain those things. Now, currently, I have an engine of one point per turn. Okay. I'm up by four, five, six. I don't really want to play these cards. And my opponent still has to play a card. Because we are ahead. Fantastic situation for us. I could have pushed a little bit further. And it's absolutely fine if I'd chosen to do so. To get more of the value out of my opponent's hand. Because they've got quite an easy catch right now. Okay, they were... Some... They had the option of using their leader ability to get themselves out of that situation. Unfortunately, they didn't do that. Um, so now they have to play another card here. They didn't take into account our engine. You will notice a lot of players early on, especially, but again, all the way up into pro rank, to be honest, will sometimes forget to calculate those passive engines. And our opponent has to play their Geralt here. It gets them out of the round, even though it doesn't play for a lot of value. They're going on the assumption that we were never going to let them get value from it anyway. We were always going to keep them low. Now, you're probably going to make the mistakes our opponent just made. It's completely normal. There is nothing wrong with making mistakes in Gwent. The beauty of the game is you just keep playing, you keep learning, and you try to remember your mistakes from last time to improve for next time. We have two mulligans. Honestly... This hand will win us the round. I'm very confident of that. But I would really like to try and find Amphibious Assault or John Natalis. So I'm going to remove reinforcements, even though it would be great in this situation for these. We find John Natalis. Fantastic. Better late than never. I am now completely happy. John Natalis here is going to find us Amphibious Assault into Illyrian Scythemen. Lyrian Scytheman is only four Fields provisions. So the one I play years. is already going to be worth nine points when it hits the board. Fantastic. Absolutely love it. Here, all's we do, because that's going to be our finisher. We just set the boat up. No problem. Get that boat ready to go. Because we're going to be clicking the boat a fair amount, my friends. There's going to be lots of boat clicking going on. We can then set up our other engines, like our Temerian Drummer. The downside here, and I have to consider what we want to do. You don't want to play too many cards into the row with the Carrick Frigate. Why? Well, because it spawns all the time. So I want this row to be full from the Carrick Frigate. But generally, you would like a soldier there. Now, Natalis is going to be that soldier for us, ideally. But, well, Natalis is our finisher here, right? So, as a result, we're going to have to play this a little differently. I'm willing to... I'm going to play one here, and we're just not going to get quite the same value as we normally would. That's not amazing for us, because this row is already nearly full now. Not amazing, so we won't get quite the same value. And we have to be very careful that this row isn't full... Because if all of our units go into this row, we're in a bit of trouble. Okay, this could have been worth more points for them if they used their leader charges earlier. But again, they're a new player. These things do happen. Now, I don't want to fill this row anymore with these cards. So, I'm going to click the boat. I'm just going to play this into the back row. Which seems weird. We always play it with the drummer, right? It's fine. 
we also need to bear in mind, John Natalis has a deploy condition. He is only usable on the melee row. So I have to make sure I don't fill this row. And now we get our engine set and ready. We can click our boat again. We are currently at six units on the front row out of the nine we can have. Still space for John Natalis and potentially that Lyrian Scytheman that we talked about. It may end up being better to actually take Voimir instead because we already have three units here. We'll make that decision when we get there. Do I feel like I need to protect Anna Strenger? I'm going to boost once, just in case. Now, Sacred... Okay. Unfortunately, our opponent had a really useful ability here. Sacred Flame is brilliant because it boosts all Fire Sworn units. But it's an order ability, so they needed another turn to do this. And they didn't. And they've also clicked the wrong row with their leader ability, so they didn't get the spawns either, unfortunately. Uh, now, we've already won this game, but for the sense of posterity, I'm going to play it out. Just to show you how it looks. So we play the John Natalis. Now, I filled that row. But I filled that row because I want to show you Voimir. Voimir is going to boost all five of those, which looks pretty impressive. And we finally play our final card here. Now, the one thing I would say, obviously, if you're already ahead by this much, you, I haven't even used my leader ability. You don't need to keep playing. But to some extent, if it's close, you want to be careful. Because again, make sure you've checked all of those passive engines. Because as we saw with our opponent, sometimes you miss them. If you miss those passive engines, you can end up throwing away a game that you'd actually won. It's definitely worth bearing that in mind. So my friends, we have a completed new starter deck. But this is not the end for us. That is the new starter tree completed, and this list will serve you very well. But there are so many improvements you can make to the list to help you progress even further as you learn new mechanics and as you understand the game a little bit more. Now, a lot of new players will get through this process, jump straight to a meta report and go, I'm going to grab a tier 1 deck and I'm going to play that. Now, you could do that, and that is an option. And it was something I used to recommend players did. Stick within your faction, build towards a tier 1 meta deck, and just jam with that. But the more I've started this process and gone from a new player's perspective, the worse an idea I feel that is. And the reason for that is, a lot of decks that are tier 1 meta lists, they ebb and flow. They're, sometimes they're great, other times they get tweaked or nerfed or changed by the developers, or they just naturally fall out of favour in the meta. Some of them have very, very simple synergies, and they're a little overtuned at certain times, and what those lists are will change every single month, every single patch. The problem is, and I've seen players do this, and actually while filming this video, a couple of players in my Twitch chat, which is where I was filming this, fed, go, so went through their experience with me, and they said, I crafted this deck. It was super simple, super easy, very powerful. I climbed really quickly. I won all my games. I got up to rank 5. It was great. The problem is when that gets tweaked or shifts out of the meta, you are inflated into a position that you don't really understand enough about the game or the game's meta to actually then play with other lists. And that can become very frustrating because you're in a rank that you're not really able to compete in early on. And then you're either losing all of your games and getting frustrated or waiting until you fall down enough ranks at the end of seasons, you fall down three at the end of each season, to feel like you can compete again. A lot of players hit that wall and then perhaps park the game and don't come back. And I don't want that for you. Almost any synergistic deck could climb up to rank five. Over the course of the time that you're going to play, you're going to be able to do that. And I'm going to leave some links for some other decks that are similar to this that you're able to grow and play into that, in theory, you could play in pro rank and it'll be an intermediate version and a pro version. Now, you're going to be able to play them. They have similar and obvious synergies to this. I'm going to leave them in the description down below. They follow very similar patterns. They aren't necessarily 
tier one super meta decks, but they follow the synergies that you've just learned. Some of the key things and are sort of more intermediate tasks for you to look at when deck building. The big thing is consistency is super valuable. So we've already talked about tutors and the value that they provide because they allow you to play multiple cards in a turn, thinning through that deck. It's the reason you only want to have 25 cards in a deck almost always because you need to see your cards to be able to pull off your synergies, right? You only get a set number of mulligans and you're only going to see a set number of cards. So consistency in a deck is crucial. It's one of the reasons why I added back in the Dun Banner in this list. Inspiring or boosting this card is super easy, even at the cost of a leader charge. And I am thinning the other one of these cards out of our deck, meaning I won't draw into it later and may then see some of my better cards. The other crucial thing to look at when you're building a deck is value that your cards are giving you. You want to polarize your provisions as much as possible. By that, I mean you would like a lot of high provision cards and then as many low value cards as possible so that your average card played is worth more. Finding as much value as possible from the cards in your deck is also important because not every Gwent card was created equal. There are many cards across the game at each provision value, but they are going to give you different value. For example, this scout is a five for four. That is the, it's the most it's ever going to play for. It's not an engine. It does nothing but play for five points. Now, at four provisions, as a unit, that's not very good. I would never recommend this card goes into your deck. Yet, at four provisions, this card is just a four for four on paper. But as you've seen, has engine synergy in our list. And we have regularly got 12 to 15 points out of this card in value added synergy. Building lists that give you value is always important. There are cards in this list, as I've said, that I would remove or add. Queen Meave, I feel like, is a really useful addition to this list. And as you gain more and more provisions, I would recommend adding a Defender. A Defender is an entire new keyword to you. It will protect an entire row, meaning that they can't be targeted for locks or direct damage and removal. Absolutely crucial for Queen Meave. She fits this synergy really well. She is a card that when inspired will tick at the end of each turn. When she ticks three times, she will boost every one of the units on your side of the board. A massive and crucial piece, but without protection, especially as you go through a few ranks higher up, she will often get damaged, removed, or locked, which is why I would recommend the defender with her. That kind of synergy exists, but you need to then fit these cards into your list. So it's about evaluating what cards are the least value to you. Do I need two tall removal cards? Geralt of Rivia is a card you're going to be seeing a lot and playing around a lot early on in the game because everybody starts with this card. But we have Prince Anseus, who is also a tall removal card and doesn't have the downside that Geralt has. He can deal with cards even if they're not nine points of power and you'll notice players start to play around, keep their cards at eight, move their engines around, that kind of thing. So Geralt is a card that you would consider getting rid of on that basis. Other cards, even though they seem like they have great synergy with your list, it's about considering how much value do they really play for. So Prince Stennis is a four base power for eight provisions and he gives you four more points of boost. Well, fantastic. So he's already eight for eight. And maybe we get a bit more value if we've got both of our, t our cards on board. So maybe he's playing at 10 for 8. Is that really that good? That's a question you need to ask. And as you develop and as you grow, you'll see the lists that I'm going to recommend as well. And the other cards that are going to go in that are going to give you better value for that. I hope you've enjoyed this video. I really do. A more intermediate series of lists, as I say, are linked down in the description below that follow similar strategies for you. But that will allow you to keep continuing on your journey. This was just the first of many guides coming your way for new players. This was Northern Realms. All five of the other factions are coming up and are going to be in this playlist, as well as some video series going through specific things that might not seem to make as much sense, especially if you're watching Twitch or YouTube, you're going to hear a lot of us say phrases and things that don't actually translate or don't get explained anywhere. Don't worry, I'm going to go through all of them. Thank you so much for choosing to watch this video. I really hope you enjoyed it. If you did, make sure you drop a like on the video and subscribe to the channel for the rest of it. Or drop over to my Twitch channel, twitch.tv forward slash Lionheart, 
where we film all of this, as well as all of my normal Gwent play, and a lot of the time I'm casting for CD Projekt Red as well, sometimes on my channel, sometimes on the official channel. I hope you enjoyed. Thank you for watching. Bye, guys.